Hello, welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 16, titled Florence, Italy. It originally premiered on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1986. It was directed by John Nicolella, who we have had numerous times. He's the showrunner, directed a whole bunch of episodes. He's not the interesting one here. The interesting one is it was written by Wilton Crawley. And I'm going to read you something from, I'm going to read you guys something from the Miami Vice uh wikia page that i caught uh who knows how true this is but i like to believe it's true because this is a pretty crappy episode <laughs> let me read this to you guys quote the episode was originally planned for the first season it was to be called the prize and was written with mick jagger or another british rocker in mind to play the lead <laughs> role the script was scrapped along with some racing footage that had already been filmed but the concept was revived for season two with sullivan playing the main character while the official writer of this episode is paul diamond The name listed in the credits is Wilton Crawley, which is the pseudonym for an unhappy writer. (laughs) Wait, what? (laughs) So basically, they had this plan for the first season. Scrap Paul Diamond had written, had basically written the episode in the for the first time, but there must have been someone else that touched it to get it ready for season two, but then decided not to credit him. Because he was, they didn't like him, or it was a bad episode, or something. They just decided that we're just going to title, we're just going to give the writing credit to some made-up person named Wilton Crawley. No, see, this goes with my theory that they, at some point, they lost part of the script, or you know, they did it out of order or something. And then he, the guy who wrote it was probably like, "I didn't write that." I imagine. So they had to was... make up a credit. It, it, it was written. By some dude. <laughs> I imagine for this, and this is how this episode plays out. They had a very detailed first five pages of the script, and then it just kind of trailed off. And then there was some notes about some ideas on how it might end. And then they just went with it. Get the cameras. Yeah. Get the people. Just, let's go for it. <laughs> yeah, the second half of the episode was written on a cocktail napkin. <laughs> There was lots of drawings of the like car racing around though, like what the racetrack would look like, and drew that out. <laughs> I got that feeling from Sonny at points in this episode that in his mind he's just going vroom vroom. <laughs> yeah, I know. He looked like he was really enjoying those race car scenes that he was doing. <laughs> Before we get started, we're gonna check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And guys, I'll start. I have something this week. I just finished a book. It's part of the Mitch Rap series. It's called American Assassin. And the reason why I picked it up is because it's about like the greatest, like the, the, um, Bourne series or like Bond. He's, he ends up being the greatest CIA assassin ever. So it, I was hoping to find a, a, a spy book that read like a Chuck Norris movie. And I <laughs> was not disappointed. I was not disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny is I just finished watching Jason Bourne, the newest <laughs> Jason Bourne movie. You and Matt Damon looks like he's 60, <laughs> hobbling around the streets. <laughs> I had a hard time separating as I was reading the book because it's it's so full of bad 80s and 90s mo- movie tropes of action movies. I just had mm-hmm. everyone identified like that's Robert Redford and that one's Chuck Norris and that one's Wesley Snipes. Like <laughs> that's just the way that it uh-huh. read. It was like those people. Hey, wait a minute. Tommy Robert Lee's Redford. The director. Robert Redford does not belong on that list. Let's get that straight. Okay. <laughs> you remove him off that list. He is not. It's just <laughs> such a shame because they, they have decided to pick up this book. They're going to turn it into a movie. It's going to be a series based on the Mitch Rap book series. It's just such a shame that Tony Scott can't direct these movies. Yeah, unfortunately. What nationality is Matt Damon going to play in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> Let's go over and talk about this episode that is full to the brim of montages because it just wasn't enough content to go around. <laughs> so let's go talk about this episode. So we open up once again on the streets of Miami and it's like just ah uh, back to Hooker Row, <laughs> the famed uh-huh. sightseeing site of Miami. And I have a question again the second week. Is prostitution illegal in Miami? Because the sure as hell doesn't look like it is. I think there's just yeah, too many it hookers. Looks like it, it, it almost looks like it's pretty much a big part of their economy down there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Melissa, it looks like the popular spot to hang out at Hooker Row is in front of Concord Electronics. <laughs> I did see that. I noticed that. Also, the croissant store. <laughs> the croissant yes. bakery. 
Yep, that's a popular place because, <laughs> because no one is buying croissants. Because for God's nothing sake. goes with. Yeah, because nothing goes with better with bread than hookers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is. It's, it's it's a fancy bread at least, right? It's not just regular bread. <laughs> <laughs> There's literally hundreds of hookers working this street. <laughs> it is it is a cornucopia of prostitutes on this street. <laughs> And there's a woman dressed like a schoolgirl. She's flaunting her stuff out on the street. The, she's talking to a person behind the glass and his mom, who owns the croissant store, comes out and yells at him and then proceeds to then yell at the hookers out of this, particularly Florence, our title character from the episode, telling her to get lost that she has to leave because she's scaring away customers and stuff and florence says uh no i can't leave i'm the best hooker ever and also if you call the cops they'll come arrest you for fatness (laughs) well i mean it was true she was kind of plump (laughs) (laughs) personally i just think that was just terrible customer service i mean (laughs) her employee there is being very nice to her trying to sell some bread (laughs) <laughs> and she just comes in and just chases away a customer. It's just terrible. He was doing the hard sell on those croissants. Like, you know you want a croissant. <laughs> you know being a hooker makes you hungry. <laughs> Eventually, someone feels bad for this poor, lonely prostitute working so hard on the street and picks her up in a very nice Porsche. Right after the Porsche once leaves. Again, once again, Miami Vice does not hesitate to go out and get as many expensive cars as they can. <laughs> it's open though. It's just packed with just nice cars the entire time. Tubbs and Crockett are driving down the street. It's like they save up the budget. I just wish they would have spent the budget maybe on a different episode. <laughs> or, or finishing the script. <laughs> maybe that's what it was. They didn't have enough paper to print it out. So they were like writing it on their hands as they were going. Like, oh, wait, that's smudge. That's not what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Tubbs, and, Tubbs and Crockett are driving down Hooker Row. And a lot of them seem to know who Crockett is. I know. <laughs> They're like, hey. <laughs> they get flagged down by two men who try to sell them a joint, and it turns out to be none other than the Fat Boys, who we have our first guest star, a legit rap group in this episode. But unfortunately, none of their music is in the episode, and they're only in it for 20 seconds. He makes them eat a joint, and then they drive away. <laughs> yeah. No, the you know Fat Boys being made up of Prince Mark Morales, Cool Rockski, Damon Cool Rockski, Wembley, there and Darren Buff Love Robinson. Buff <laughs> Love. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that was too much for me. I just I, I love their nicknames. I just wanted to get that in there. Yeah. <laughs> so we keep driving and driving and driving and driving. Crockett starts to explain that the Miami Grand Prix is going to be happening in town. Then Crockett starts to scare the hell out of Tubbs doing donuts in the middle of the road and then pretending like he's going to run a red light. And I have to think that Tubbs has to question constantly, like, why did I move to Miami? Why did I come here? <laughs> My crazy he's ass just partner. Got, Crockett's just got this child's like look in his eyes. He's the whole time he's, he's like speeding toward the room. Like room, room. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> he, he must have wanted. I, I bet you he had a race car bed when he was growing up. What's always great is that you can tell when there's a stunt driver, like say in the boat or in the car. And so Tubbs looks more relaxed when it's happening or when. Don Johnson's doing it because the fear in Philip Michael Thomas's face when when Don Johnson is doing it is real fear. <laughs> yeah, he looks like. Could you imagine, you know, like behind the scenes when the jerk told him that, <laughs> you know, like like you're gonna let him do what? <laughs> and I gotta be in the car. <laughs> no, he really doesn't like boats. Let's get that straight. It's the boats. <laughs> Every time he's in a boat, his eyeballs are huge. And he's like hanging on and he's all stiff. Like, no, he didn't do boats very well. <laughs> well, eventually, just randomly, once again, a case just falls into the lap of Tubbs and Crockett. They see that same Porsche, comes flying around traffic, takes off down the street. Crockett takes it as his opportunity to get a little racing. And so they chase after the Porsche. And after a short period of time, the Ferrari spins out. Crockett loses him. The Porsche takes the opportunity to dump Florence's body, her dead body, out of the car and drive away. Tubbs and Crockett stop to get out, hand over the mouth. Oh, my God. 
slowly walk up just in case she's like a zombie maybe <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to the opening credits they don't offer any medical attention they just walk up really slowly and touch <laughs> her barely and they're like yeah she's dead that's it you can do the credits now we're ready <laughs> so i do want to point out that Bubs and crockett are just driving around a regular vehicle like they don't have a police light or nothing they have no reason to be just Randomly chasing a Porsche around the city. Yeah, uh, exactly. Let alone a way to actually pull him over. I mean, if I'm a dude just driving my Porsche around, yeah, you know, I might get freaked out if this guy's chasing me around town. <laughs> There's never a way to know that they're actually cops that are chasing you. Like, hell yeah, I would run. Yeah, yeah, that's not a cop part. Cops don't drive Ferraris. I guess in the end, he is kind of a D bag for leaving this hooker just wherever the hell he wants. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> take it to a dock, so, you know, throw in a dumpster, like clean up after yourself. <laughs> the question is in me, like this whole episode, it, it could not exist when he realizes he has a dead hooker in his car. If he wasn't running red lights and dra- driving around people, causing a t- causing people to pay attention to him, he may have gotten away with it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I also want to point out that he beat Crockett in the race. <laughs> so I, I think that's why they got out all slow. I think he was very upset that he um he he lost the chase, as it will. An incredibly long open too. This was like ten minutes long. In fact, we get more content in the open than we do in the rest of the episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, it's still that same night, it's late night. The bureau and the ladies are there with Castillo. They found out the name of the prostitute was Florence Italy. They had Tubbs and Crockett followed the Porsche, but there was no plates on it, so they don't know. They have no idea who it is. Uh, Tubbs is just kind of talking out loud. Who would know anything about some fancy car like that out on the streets of Miami? Is there someone that might know about that kind of thing? And Crockett is like, oh, yeah, I know a mechanic that seems to work on really fancy cars. Never once do they stop to think, like, you know, the Miami Grand Prix is in town. I wonder if it's somehow involved with this race. (laughs) (laughs) Tommy being the only Porsche mechanic in the entire city of Miami. Um, Tommy's Porsches. If you have a Porsche, you got to come here. (laughs) <laughs> there ain't nowhere else. <laughs> well, Melissa, and you also noticed that Tubbs is a madman drinking orange juice at like 3 o'clock in the morning. He's such a crazy guy, like partying down, <laughs> drinking his orange juice at like 3 in the morning or something. He acted weird this entire episode. I just want to say so that ahead of time. He's been he's weird in this episode. He's like way too intense in this episode. He takes it very seriously, I think. He was very upset last week and a little bit dangerous because the hooker was under 18. And this True. is in Florence, yeah. Italy is under 18. So if you're over 18 and you're hooker, Tubbs don't care. Yeah, if you're a he kid, don't got time for you. <laughs> he's fucking pissed. <laughs> yeah. He's fucking so, revenge. <laughs> so what you're saying is that they might not to it might be more than just orange juice in that glass. <laughs> yeah, I think it was vodka in there. I think that's what was wrong the whole time. <laughs> the next morning, the duo goes over to Tommy's repair shop. And like this is the setup here is nothing. They just come inside. Hey, you know anything about a Porsche and the 906 Carrera? She's like, yeah, a lot. There's this one guy named Danny Tepper. He has one. And uh, he's he's entered in the Grand Prix for the first time. His sponsor some beer company. He lives over on this street down by the water. You should go talk to him. Yeah. Thanks. And she never asked, I like, why bad. they want to know. I, I feel bad for Tommy, actually. I feel bad for Tommy because her character was brought in to replace the Doug man. And mm-hmm. this is all we're going to get is these little stop offs for her to, to feed them information. I know. Um, it's so sad that we, we not only did we have to say goodbye to Noogie. And so now we're saying goodbye to Tommy too. <laughs> <sighs> Such a sad yeah. day. Now on the plus side, we get way more Izzy. So that's okay too. Now, Izzy's <laughs> the best anyway. So. <laughs> he is the greatest actor Ever. Yes, that's what I meant. He's the best of all time. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so for the next twenty minutes of the episode, we're going to be at the precinct with Danny because the duo goes and picks up Danny, and this just trugs along very slowly until they get to the point of their interrogation of Danny. He says he hasn't driven the car in a week. He didn't even know it was stolen until the duo picked him up. But he's really mad about it. He's, I can't believe you bugging me. Basically, his wife is also in the hospital, and she is two weeks overdue. So he was out. We find out that what he was doing, that he was his wife couldn't handle him being at the hospital anymore, so she made him leave. He went out to hang out with his buddies. He left at 10 30, which is which he told them a lie at first. They caught him in a lie. 
And then he said he just drove around in his truck listening to tapes. Yeah, what were they tapes of? <laughs> I must know this. What the hell were they tapes of? Like, was that music? Or was it, like, self-help? Or what was it? <laughs> it's racing <Motorhead>. sound. <laughs> it's like, vroom, vroom, vroom. Screech, screech. <laughs> I just imagine it's like in Rocky Four, where he's after he's all sad about Apollo Creed dying, and they got the song that's specifically about that scene playing it on the radio. <laughs> yeah, convenient it's playing on the radio at that time. I just, love how he's like, I just love how he's how he's like, oh, I never drive that Porsche, <laughs> not the white one. <laughs> what Crockett sees in this is that, and what I guess what Tubbs and Crockett both see is that. Danny is clearly telling the truth, like he's not the murderer, but he knows something that he's not telling them. After they're done and him, they leave, and then Danny's dad comes in, and Danny's dad has <laughs> got to be one of the weirdest vice characters. He just comes in, he's like, hey, so I know I was a bad dad, and like, uh, I know we don't hang out that often, but it's really good to see you. Then he pats him on the shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> he's like the worst vice dad ever, right? Yeah. Like there's something wrong with his. Yeah, he's he's, he's very strange because he comes up like at, at, from the very beginning. He's like, "Hey, you know, how you doing? Like, I'm sorry, I wasn't the greatest dad. I got some money stashed away if you need it." <laughs> it's like, dude, we're still at the police station. Like, let, let's get out the door before we start hatching plans to go to Mexico. You know. <laughs> My favorite moment of this whole episode is right here. At the very end of this conversation, Danny's like, hey, so it's great that you have my back. And he reaches out with his left hand and he pats his dad on the elbow, but he kind of hooks him. Like, like maybe the dad didn't know that in the script that pulled for him the hug, they like didn't like each other. So the dad, so the guy who plays Frank wasn't going to hug him. So there was this awkward moment where Danny like pats him and then they're just like staring at each other, but it wasn't following the script. So Danny, the, 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 <laughs> Indie driver was really confused. I have created this huge backstory on this scene because it is so awkward. It's so <laughs> awkward. He just kind of reaches out and taps him on the elbow. And then on top of that, John, you, uh, uh, you'll fill us in on the person who plays Danny. He's not even an actor. So that's even better. It's like, okay, so they told him to do something. And then maybe Frank, the act, the guy who's playing Frank didn't do it. And so now he's really confused because he's, he really is a race car driver. Let's not get too far. He, he, he does consider himself an actor. <laughs> um, even though nothing that well, he actually I mean. acted on is anything that I think made money. <laughs> um, except for commercials. But he is played by Daniel Sullivan III. Danny Sullivan being a an actual uh, IndyCar race car driver. Actually, when he joined IndyCar, it was still called Kart. But a few interesting things. He worked as a lumberjack and as a cabbie before he got, he broke out in, in the racing. <laughs> uh, a cabbie in New York, which explains the racing background. <laughs> In the car in 82, he tried for a year in Formula One before going back to IndyCar, where he would basically be successful, man. He in the Miami Vice episode because he might have just happened to win the Indianapolis 500 in 1985. Oh, that that little known race. Yeah, yeah. So he's pretty pretty much this is the high point and for one of the high points for him, you know, <laughs> but he would actually have five top 10s in the Indy 500. He would win a uh, Indy championship in 88. I'm going to I'm going to call a conspiracy theory in here because Danny Sullivan the 3rd, he looks an awful lot like Kurt Thomas who was the one that starred in the movie Jim Cotta. Those <laughs> two guys look a lot alike. And Jim Cotta happened to come out in 1985. <laughs> Dude, uh, you know, I was trying to, I, I was watching it, uh, watching the movie, and I was like, I can't put my finger on where I've seen that guy from. So I think you hit it on the head there. But uh, <laughs> Luckily for Danny... Um, if he's if you really, also, if he really is the same guy that's in Jim Cotta, things are always strategically placed for him when he needs to drive a car. <laughs> there's, a, there's a Porsche car. There's, the, there's a Porsche right there for him. If he needs to battle uh -huh. a gang of goons, there just happens to be a pummel horse in the middle of the area. <laughs> Little side note, not to spoil for the race at the end of the episode, but he also won the Miami IndyCar race in 1985 and 86. Oh, so, weird. Yeah, yeah. So he actually won this exact race in the show. He retired from racing in 95 after he broke his pelvis in a uh, pretty serious wreck at Michigan. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> um, 
Sorry, did you say, he didn't die, right? No. Huh? No, he's, okay. he, he injured his pelvis, he said. Oh, okay, there we go. He okay. broke his he died pelvis from... in an accident. Sorry. He died of his dick being broken. <laughs> he died from his pelvis breaking. <laughs> Horrible sex out, accident. Yeah, turns out that's where his heart so, was, so right in his pelvis. Illegal. His humps just always lean to the left now because he doesn't have the strength anymore. <laughs> his lovely lady no, yeah. humps are ruined. <laughs> So back back to the episode. After this awkward scene, which I'll, I'll have you know, I'm going to go back and and watch that end scene between the dad, between Frank and Danny, the dad and Danny, like it's the Laputer film of Kennedy being assassinated in <laughs> Dallas. <laughs> I'm obsessed with that scene now. <laughs> but after that, we see that the duo are talking to Castillo. Tubbs is saying Danny's story is really lame. Crockett is telling Castillo that he got really soft when he saw the picture of Florence. They know that he didn't do it, but he knows something, so they're going to keep following him. It just happens to be a cocktail party with Danny and Frank, so they should go there, convince Danny to let them in there as Burnett and Cooper. And Melissa, when we were watching this episode, we were both wondering, why are Burnett and Cooper going? Why aren't the ladies going to the party (laughs) with someone being investigated for killing hookers? It would make more sense, right? I mean, who else is going to like attract the guy who killed a hooker? But hookers, <laughs> exactly. he might want to come beat them up. He might see them and be like, damn, hookers, I got to beat them up. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe know. they're also friend, friendly with Jamaicans. So, you know. Also, also, when we were watching the show, I also made the comment like, who else would they be? They're always Burnett and Cooper. They're like, we should go with Burnett and Cooper. Do they have other names? <laughs> I mean, who else are they going to go as? Oh, first of all, I know for a fact that Crockett doesn't have another Casually, name. Usually, Tubbs calls himself Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who else are they going to go at? I just, I don't know. <laughs> it's just weird to me being an IndyCar event and everyone's very American. Well, let's go over to the party and where this, where the writing in <laughs> the episode the birthday party? Really, really starts to go downhill. They just, they just didn't have anything written down at this point. I suspect the rest of the episode from here on out is directed by Tommy Wiseau. <laughs> Leave Tommy alone. Don't <laughs> insult him. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I feel like I feel like nothing really gets said. I feel like we should just jump to the uh, the amazing race down the world's largest parking garage. <laughs> Well, when we show up to the party, first of all, it's like, is this like a Chuck E. Cheese birthday party? There's balloons, paper table covers with like the checker flag on it. There's our racing arcade games. Like the only thing that's missing is animatronic animals up on stage singing to the guests at this party. <laughs> <laughs> and we come in and there's a man who ends up being Worthington, Marty Worthington. He's talking to a man that has, to another man that has an amazing skullet. <laughs> that guy's hair was too much. <laughs> it was too distracting. I couldn't concentrate on what was being said. I just kept staring at his like receding hairline. Like, why didn't you just shave it off? Just shave it off. <laughs> or at least cut the mullet part. <laughs> <laughs> and the conversation between these two, I, I can't even put together what the hell they were talking about. All I have is that one person says Danny's dad's too old to be racing. Cause so we find out that Frank, his dad, is also <laughs> racing in the race. And then the other guy says, like, well, then he also says, for some other reason, he says, well, that's D U M B. No, you're too, the, if you think that's the case, then you're too D U M B to figure it out. <laughs> that's what he said in, in like some weird southern accent, then he's not southern. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you're too D U M B to figure it out. <laughs> like, you're not southern. Why did you do that? <laughs> And I'm just watching him. I'm like, that's the bad guy from Dumb and Dumber. So, funny story. He's a lot of different. Uh, he, he was in a lot of different. He's got a very strange backstory. Let me just kind of run through it here. He is. His name is Charles Claveri. Probably pronouncing that wrong. But everyone. Sounds good to me. Stage name, his stage name is Charles Rocket. So, also known as Charlie Hamburger. <laughs> and Char- Charlie Kennedy, and I knew you were gonna love that Charlie Hamburger part. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, I'm so done laughing. He's an actor and a comedian. He was actually um, kind of his breakout thing was he was on SNL after the after the original members left. He was part of that first 
put together cast. He was on so he was on Saturday Night Live from 1980 until February of 81. And during that time, he was the guy that did Weekend Update. Damn. Uh, as one of his things. He was let go in February after negative reviews cuz people didn't feel like he lived up to the, you know, former cast members Chevy Chase and those guys. But also because at the end of one episode in of the episode in February, he could be heard dropping an F-bomb at oh. the end of the episode. So they got fined, they kind of used that as part of an excuse to cut loose him and another couple people, and he was replaced by Gilbert Godfrey. Oh. But we also know him as the villain from Dumb and Dumber, or the dad from Hoc- in Hocus Pocus. Oh, yeah. So he was also in, mov- in Earth Girls Are Easy, It's Packed, <laughs> and Dances with Wolves. What um, an odd mix. Guess- yeah, dude. And his guest starred some TV shows quant- like Quantum Leap, Wings, and King of Queens. He also played the accordion and was the front man of a band called the Fabulous Motels. Mm. For a short time, he was also a news anchor in Colorado under his given name, Charlie Kennedy. But sadly, his life ended in October 2005 when his body was discovered in a field next to his Connecticut home. They found him, his throat had been slit, and ultimately it was ruled a suicide, which is very odd. To say Questionable least. to say the least, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that that was that was just a roller coaster ride. Like, He's the all over that, the place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, just kind of a mishmash. Well, there's no real way to segue from an unfortunate death of an actor who we've seen in a bunch of different stuff so let's just go over back to the skullet man goes over to the bar and here's <laughs> Tubbs telling Danny about who, asking him who the murderer could be <laughs> <laughs> and then Tommy comes up and is complaining about a woman named Becky Sklar who ta- Danny refers to as a racer chaser <laughs> clever Danny <laughs> Tommy's very mad about Becky. She makes some comments about her setting back feminism, which of course causes Crockett to get a boner. <laughs> <laughs> the Scullet Man then goes over to talk to Mr. Anus. Is that, was that his <laughs> name? Was, Mr. Anus? I thought it was Anus, but it was Ramos. <laughs> Ramos. Oh, but he, Ramos. He pronounced it he Ramos. It Ramos like he's a, a really oh, white guy. <laughs> makes more sense now. <laughs> <laughs> so and then we find out that Ramos is a sponsor. <laughs> Worthington is a sponsor. They're both they both have a Tepper driving Frank or Danny. And then so Marty Worthington's like, it. let's go make them race in the let's go make them race motorcycles inside of a parking garage. Just curious, which one of those guys do you think is the representative of Low and Brow? I know I read about that too. That they are a spo- they they were a sponsor of Danny, and so he was. They kind of snuck in some low and brow references throughout the episode. Snuck in, man. Everything was low and brow around Danny. <laughs> I do want to point out one last thing in this scene because Cooper and Burnett come up to talk to them to try and get their in with the sponsors <laughs> and with and with the Teppers. And so let me make sure I understand this story correctly. Tubbs says that. Him and Crockett are brothers and that they have money and are willing to sponsor racers because and their money came from their dad who invented the auto shut off feature for sinks at airports and gas station bathrooms. Am I under- am I understanding that correctly? Yep. That's what he said. <laughs> I, I'm calling baloney. I, I'm calling baloney. That that technology, I know exactly what company that technology came from. <laughs> Hard people worked on that technology. <laughs> the story is so confusing that even Marty Worthington is like, okay. Yeah, he's like, what? <laughs> Whatever. That's a so weird story. The, the whole reason people sponsor race cars is so that people will buy their product. So they just want to put their names on the side of his car? Like, what are they hawking? <laughs> I don't like, know. They're not attached to any company. So it's just like, hey, we want to sponsor a car for no reason. Also, the just... Because they, we've given up on this, on writing anything down at this point. The Skullet Man overhearing the conversation between Tubbs, they make an emphasis in the scene to show that he heard that. Never comes up again. They <laughs> yeah, all, I know. 
<laughs> also, in, by after this, Tubbs and Crockett cease being Cooper and Burnett. It's never a thing again. They don't need to be Cooper and Burnett through the rest of the episode. So, which leads yeah, to the it, motorcycle race and makes it even more confusing because at the end of the motorcycle race, Crockett congratulates Danny on his baby being born because he gets a call on his car phone. If they had just met to be sponsors from this sync automated company, how would he know that? <laughs> Dude, this is, I, I don't think it's ever been said in any kind of media, but it, the motorcycle race ruined this this show. You know, or like that's where everything went wrong. Like I, I don't think I've ever seen a movie and said like the motorcycle race. That's where everything went awry. You know, <laughs> but that's what happens. So even the race itself. So they they both start out on on top of uh, the parking garage, which only looks to be about four or five stories tall at the time. And then they start going, and as they're racing, they start racing, and they start going through the parking garage, and the parking garage magically, it goes forever. They it must does. drive down about 30 stories <laughs> before they finally get to the bottom. <laughs> it does. It goes on forever, and we leave from the scene suspecting that Worthington is the one is our primary suspect. One thing that we really learn is that the sponsors can dictate to their drivers to do whatever they want. The sponsors are totally out of control. And that also that Danny and Frank really don't like each other. That's all that we get. The only thing that comes back in any of this is that Danny and Frank don't like each other. Everything else was for nothing. None of this was needed. Again, back to there wasn't enough script to go around. So let's just start making shit up. And for the rest of the episode, Tubbs and Crockett are just going to take the rest of the episode off. (laughs) <laughs> just gonna hang out with the race car drivers and they're gonna make the b team and the girls do all the footwork in yeah. the investigation <laughs> they're well, just danny- gonna hang out and watch IndyCar car practice <laughs> well danny takes off to go see his baby we have a brief soft over at the precinct where the duo goes to tell dad what they found so far the ladies say they haven't been able to find it, any information on florence italy um i want to break it so it's a city in italy <laughs> Look it up on Wikipedia. You'll you'll find out lots of information. <laughs> <laughs> Dad says, or Castillo says, just keep working the drivers. So then we go over to the hospital. And I have to say that Danny's wife is a trooper. Man, <laughs> <laughs> she looks fantastic after being two weeks over here and giving birth to this baby. <laughs> Without her husband, by the way, because he was off road riding a motorcycle with his dad. That's the worst excuse for missing your child being born ever. Yeah. I was riding a motorcycle with my dad. Sorry about that. (laughs) And she's like, oh, it's okay, honey. I know you were working hard. It's all right. Don't worry. (laughs) Another confusing scene that's just sandwiched in there. He tells us, he tells her that he's, she's like rubbing his head and stuff like it's going to be okay. It's like she just gave birth. Okay. Back to Danny being a sorry baby. He's really mad that the cops don't believe him that he didn't have anything to do with it. And then they made him let them work the party. And then he opens up this package that was anonymously dropped off. And inside of there is a Porsche that's been crunched up and burned. Like a little mini model. Which means, I don't know. Did Frank drop it off there? I don't know. I think he did. I don't did. know what it means. I think he did. I don't know. Yeah. That that well, doesn't come back either. It never makes any sense why they even talk about it, why they even show it. I mean. No. You know, Danny's there whining like, you know, everyone I pay believes me. I don't get why the cops don't believe me. <laughs> because, I mean, it, you know, every day someone steals a car and kills a hooker. Um, <laughs> you know, and then like, it, if Danny's dad is involved, wh- why would he send that if he was, was he blackmailing him? I don't know. Like maybe um, I don't I, get I, it. I just, <laughs> I'm so confused. I so this, this I ep- feel like we need a montage. Yes. You know, we just need a montage to think about things. Let's let shake it off. We're gonna go to a montage. We have a first stop at the croissant store. The ladies ask the mom. She's like, "Yeah, I, re- I re- recognize the hooker, but they get no information." And so then the team starts working the street, and we get a hooker search montage. By the way. By the way, bread lady still not selling any bread. No, she even sell donuts to cops. Nope, she couldn't sell anything. She's got a terrible attitude, by the way. So in the hooker search montage, we get these so often in Miami Vice. We really need like a special name for them because they just happen <laughs> so frequently in Miami Vice, where the team is out working the street talking to hookers. I, I'm getting so familiar with them that I'm starting to look to see if they're the same hookers. Like if I recognize anyone, is it the same montage? They're just using it over and over again. <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe. Also, uh, they, you know, it would be good. Like a theme song for the hookers while they, that could be their mantra. And you know, right away, there's going to, this, this is going to be looking for hookers. <laughs> yeah. This is going to be looking for hookers. This song. Yeah. This is if, the hooker if, song. <laughs> if Jan Hammer made a song, made the Crockett's theme and made the Tubbs theme, this should be the hooker montage theme. This should be a Jan Hammer ho- hooker theme. For the record, I don't think Tubbs sure has a theme. Tried. I, I'm sure he came to him with like a, a clarinet solo <laughs> or something. And they just looked at him funny. He was like, what is the hooker thing? Oh, sh- uh, never mind. <laughs> all I'm I could gonna think go about back to hanging was, out with Phil Collins. <laughs> all I could think about was Squidward when he said the clarinet. Like Squidward and Spongebob where he like rides his bicycle underwater and plays the clarinet all sad. <laughs> We have a, so this again. We have all these scenes that don't make any sense. They'll never tie back to anything. There's a really fast scene where the B team p- picks up the drag queen that was hanging out with Florence. She doesn't have any information. She doesn't pass along anything. So it's all for nothing. We head over to the track the next day, and the duo approaches Danny, and Danny's getting really tired of being harassed. Frank comes over and yeah, Dad and tells him to know, get lost. I'm just going to stop you. Pretty much, no one wants to talk to the duo at the track. And so the only way they can get information is to do what they always do and find a hot dog cart. <laughs> <laughs> Very soon. Because Tubbs, so in the argument with Tubbs, with uh, Frank, Tubbs says, quote, why don't you get out of my face, man? <laughs> and I just love Tubbs' wisdom. Straightforward <laughs> honesty. I just, I just love the man. <laughs> Frank storms away. Danny looks back at Crockett all sad, like, save me. Crockett runs over and tells Danny that Abigail Cook was Florence Italy's real name. Clearly, Danny knows something. He's just not telling him, and Crockett can see it. So then the duo decides to leave, and they're like, oh, shucks, we're back to square one. And Tubbs finally puts it together that the racer chaser, Becky Sklar, who sleeps with everybody, might know something if a driver is involved. And Crockett goes, yeah. And then they take two steps forward and go, hey, Becky, can we talk to you for a minute? (laughs) (laughs) Convenient. She was right there. Really. And then, like, of course, that's the hot dog cart. Yeah. I just thought it was interesting that they took the racer chaser over to the hot dog stand. (laughs) Yeah. She's already seen them all. (laughs) Like, they start talking to her and she's like eating the hot dog while they're talking to her. (laughs) Like, that's got to be so distracting if you're crocking in tubs. So then again, we're at a scene that makes no sense. She says that she slept with most of the drivers and the mechanics on the tour. Crockett asks her if she knows anyone of anyone who's been rough with women or something. And she just like, she just tries to storm away. Tubbs grabs her and she then says, I was in the hospital for nine months. My jaw was wired shut. You're never going to protect me. Well, she's right. The bike team isn't going to protect her. (laughs) No, no. I just, everyone keeps making this face like Tubbs and Crockett just reek or something, you know? (laughs) She storms away, and then I get any, Crockett's like, I could get anything out of her. It's like, okay, cool. Thanks for the last five minutes. Seen this for nothing. (laughs) Yeah. So then they're still just hanging out on Pit Road, and they see the Teppers up at the top of the grandstands having an argument. So then the camera jumps up there and we have a chance to listen in on the conversation. And we jump right into here. <laughs> Frank tells Danny, sorry, but your mom was a whore. <laughs> and I don't think I'm your dad because she slept around a lot. <laughs> There's this guy, Pete. Pete used to come along. <laughs> Frank's saying to stop worrying about the being accused of murder. Concentrate on the race. It's what's best for Danny Jr. And Danny just storms and so off. it's clear at this point that the, Danny's dad's the killer, right? Like, yeah, it just makes sense now. Yeah, he's just covering up, making sure his son doesn't talk about it. The next day at the race, we have another montage. It because goes why on. Not? <laughs> yeah, it's basically a music video. It lasts like the whole length of the song, and then it ends with us seeing a so, conversation with Marty placing a bet on the race. Which doesn't really I, I, come I into do, play. <laughs> I do want to point out that our guest stars, the Fat Boys, covered both the twist and the Beach Boys wipeout. Uh-huh. And neither were used for this montage. <laughs> Why even have the Fat Boys on? Why? Why? I know. I know. <laughs> you tell me what wipeout would not have fit in that moment. <laughs> it would have at the end of the montage we head out to the street and once again depressed Tubbs and crockett are kicking their can down the road like i guess we're gonna go back to square one we got nothing and Tubbs is like hey crockett i'm gonna get you a, ca- a 
cappuccino, something a little different. Which means that normally Crockett would take whiskey at this point. <laughs> 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 and they just happen to be. He goes to get a cappuccino from the croissant store. Notice he did not get Sorry, a croissant. No- <laughs> no one wants your damn croissant. <laughs> Not the hookers, lady. Notice it's your croissant. At the end of the scene. Notice how at the end of the scene he doesn't even leave with coffee. No, no. all they do is bread, and no one wants her bread. <laughs> this lady doesn't get it. Tubbs happens to see that they have a security camera and was able to get a tape from mom. I'm just gonna call her mom. <laughs> get the tape from mom from three days before, so that they can. Look at the tape. He just flashes his badge. No warrant or anything, you know. Just flash the badge and you give me the tape. Over at the precinct, they're watching the tape. And everyone, I like, it's my favorite trope of a police show. They're watching a black and white mid-80s security camera. And they just sit in front of the rolling, the TV on the rolling cart and just scream at it. Enhance! Enhance! And luckily, (laughs) it enhances, and they see that it's Frank Tepper driving the Porsche that night. He's the one that killed Florence Italy, or Abigail something. I forgot her last name. (laughs) Ouch. (laughs) She died for nothing. She died in vain now. I don't remember her name. (laughs) So they got their man. They got to go bust them down. Before they leave, Castillo asks, you know, like, hey, make sure you get an 8x10 of that for me, please. Like, to get that framed on the office wall. (laughs) It looked great. <laughs> so now we go to the final scene of the episode. The race has started, and the duo plus a whole bunch of officers are racing over. Get it? Racing <laughs> over to the track to go arrest Frank. And then we go into another montage. This time, we essentially watch the entire race. The montage was like 17 this, this, minutes long. This scene is sp- uh, sponsored by Lowenbrow, by the way. <laughs> So, pretty much the entire montage just sponsored by Low and Brown. Just on the helmet, on the side of the car, for the entire race. So, they had such an opportunity here, too. The guy beat Crockett in the chase earlier. I was expecting, like, somehow, you know, Crockett's going to end up in the race, and they're going to have to race him down on the I track. Was so... you know, I was so excited. I was so excited too. I was so hoping that was going to be like the great McCarthy where they, he's like hidden in the fire suit and he Crockett's secretly going to race in one of the cars. And then, and then when he wins, he'll turn and handcuff Frank. I was so hoping that that's what this yeah. was going to be, but no, no, <laughs> but instead no. <laughs> we get 17 minutes so of just real like race Michael footage. Andretti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead of we get 17 minutes of stock racing footage. And then at the end, Danny wins. Frank doesn't even get out of his car by the time he hears sirens. So he just takes off on the bro. track. And luckily, That's really one. <laughs> luckily, part of the track is open out to the Miami s- streets. So he takes off out into Miami. There's another chase. It's turned from a racing montage to a chase montage. No one but the race announcer has said a word in like the last 24 minutes. It's just been driving <laughs> for the last 24 minutes. Eventually, Frank is cornered and he turns a left straight into a wall. The You get to see the windshield crack. Freeze frame. Episode's over. Just... They clearly did not have an ending written down. And they're like, I don't know. Just keep driving. Just, <laughs> Drive just until keep, you hit the wall. <laughs> just keep driving. <laughs> it's like in Grand Theft Auto where you-, you have five stars. And then you eventually just get tired because they can't catch you, but you get tired of running, so you just, like, drive off a bridge. Yeah, I know, but, I mean, like, uh, they had so many different ways they could end it, and they ended with, uh, I don't know, make them drive into a wall. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that makes no sense. Why would he just randomly just decide, you know what, I can't escape the cops, I'm just going to drive into a wall? I don't know. At least go out in a hail of gunfire or something. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Well, let's go talk about this fat boys less music that we have in this episode. <laughs> Very disappointing. Let's, uh, John, let's go get your rundown on the music. All right, John, I took a sneak peek at the music, and there were some people that didn't have Wikipedia pages. So I'm intrigued to see how much information you found out about people. Oh, yeah. So let's start things off with the song Naughty Naughty by John (laughs) Parr. He's an English musician who had two number one hits in the 80s. So let's go on to our next song. I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) That was it. (laughs) Those two hits were St. Elmo's Fire, Man in Motion. Um, Oh! 
Oh, and the which song, I talked Nani about, Nani. <laughs> which I talked about in one of the episodes of This Week in Vice when it was number one. He sold 10 million records worldwide just based on those two songs. He also wrote and performed 12 Hollywood movie themes, including Three Men and the Baby and the Running Man theme. <laughs> in 1983, he wrote songs for Meat Loaf's album Bad Attitude, toured with people like Tina Turner and Hart, and wrote songs for Tom Jones and the Monkees. Um, did the Monkees have more than one song? Yeah, they did. Yeah, I mean, they had like two okay. or three. They had, yeah, they had like their whole albums, but... I mean, I think I had like two or three popular ones. I'm only ones. aware of the one. I'm waiting to hear what that uh, is, John. So What's the name of that song? <laughs> I'm just kidding. What's the name hey, of the hey, monkeys? Hey, we're the monkeys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> like, isn't that the one from the show? Yeah, that's like yeah. their theme. Um, that was the theme from the show, yeah. The theme, that, that's all I know about the monkeys. Then the last thing I will say about John Parr, because I might as well get it out of the way. Late in 1986, he co-presented the UK League of the American Music Awards with Phil Collins. God like, Phil, damn it. The hell out my music. God damn it, Phil. Can't go a week. <laughs> <laughs> me. Guys everywhere. <laughs> all right, our next song is "Selling the Store" by Cliff Sardé. He's a Grammy-nominated composer, video editor, and recording artist. He plays the saxophone. He was he led a saxophone jazz fusion band uh, and released four <laughs> albums in the eighties. Sang saxophone, the flute, the guitar, and the keyboards. So and then he just does a bunch. He just did a bunch of composer stuff. So outside of playing jazz music but if you're not in the jazz you probably wouldn't know or if you weren't in the jazz in the 80s you probably wouldn't know who the, who this guy is so, miami vice um, soundtrack is a deep cut of jazz like if you wanted a jazz education don't take that community college class study up on the music no. that was in miami vice yeah yeah so dominic if you want to learn more about cliff sarde he lives in phoenix so i'm, I'm <laughs> sure he's local you can friend him on facebook um <laughs> I almost did, but I thought it would be a little weird. Um, <laughs> so, the next song is Cruise Missile by the Steve Morse Band. Let's see. Guitar, uh, guitar, the composer. He's best known for his band Dixie Dregs. And then in 1994, he became the guitarist for Deep Purple. And he <laughs> recorded six albums with them. Awesome. I didn't know Deep Purple kept making that many albums after 1994. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know they had that uh, many albums. <laughs> dude, doing my research, I, I found out that sometimes that Deep Purple still tours, and sometimes Joe Satriani tours as their guitarist. I want to see Deep Purple now. Yes. So, D Dixie, Dixie was a band he broke out with in about 1983 until about the late 80s. Well, until 1986 when he joined Kansas. He would only be in Kansas for a year and he would play on their albums Power and their album In the Spirit of Things, but he also co-wrote one of their top 20 hits. Every person who currently lives in Kansas has said, I'm only going to be here for a year. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> They're still there. <laughs> They're still there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he recently joined the super group Flying Colors. I don't know why they're a super group. Uh, I mean, one of the. <laughs> his, he joined with his longtime bandmate, Dave LaRue, who was also in Dixie Dregs. So, I mean. I guess that makes them, you know, because they were in the same band once. That makes them a super group. I don't know. <laughs> so what's kind of funny about Dixie Dregs as a band is that they kind of they, they kind of had to fight for it, man. So they had one label go bankrupt on them, and then they had another label that forced them to add lyrics to songs. So the the label that forced them to add lyrics to songs forced them to do it on an album they called Industry Standard. I, I think for ironic purposes. <laughs> uh, and people loved it. Steve Morse was voted best guitarist and held by Guitar Magazine and held that title for five years based on that album alone. Good call record industry? I, I don't know. I, I will point out that Guitar Magazine, the only other person who has held that honor of best guitarist for five years was Eric Johnson, who's another famous guitarist, and Steve Howe of Yes. <laughs> So Suddenly they lost a lot of credibility. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is also the name of his band. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Let's get to the next song of the episode. It's Up From The Skies by Jimi Hendrix. And guys, I can just talk forever about Jimi Hendrix. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Before I'm, uh, I'm just going to do a quick summary of who he is, and hopefully we get him again, and I can go a little bit more detail onto him. But he was born Johnny Allen Hendrix, uh, but took up the stage name James Marshall, otherwise known as Jimi Hendrix. Born November 27th, 42, in Seattle, Washington, represent. <laughs> he died September 18th, 1970, from a barbiturate from asphyxiation. He had a long-known drug problem, but some things that you might not know. One, his mainstream career only spanned about four years. He was, in 1961, he enlisted in the Army, trained as a paratrooper for the 101st Airborne, and was honorably discharged in 62. If you wonder why his military time was so short, that's because when he was 19, cops caught him twice riding in stolen cars and forced him to choose between prison and joining the army. And after a year of being in the army, the all of his sergeants kept coming back saying, like, this guy does not care, give a flying crap about the army. He's not <laughs> showing up. He's showing up late. He's sleeping in. So they discharged him. He moved to Tennessee he worked at, he was in the Isley Brothers backup band and then worked his way up into playing with Little Richard from 63 to 65. In 1966, he would move to England, like actually like a lot of blues artists at the time. And he would actually be managed by Chaz Chandler of The Animals, his first manager. Hmm. And that's when he would record the hits Hey Joe, Purple Haze, and The Wind Cries Mary. So in 1968, Hendrix released his third and final album. And actually, that was when he finally got recognition in the U.S. from the album Electric Land that would shoot up to number one. 1969, he would be considered the world's highest paid performer and would headline Woodstock. In 1970, he would headline the Isle of Wight Festival. Before he would tragically die from a pitch with asphyxiation. So, which is get into his death and the suspicious circumstances and stuff like that. But that's mm -hmm. pretty much in a hand basket, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, and I would say you know, there's so many, so many classics. But if I have to pick out one or two songs, maybe three songs that are like my favorites, Castles Made of Sand is high up there for me. I constantly go back to that. Red House, and of course, The Wind Cries Mary. Yeah, yeah, I think The Wind Cries Mary is probably my all-time. But let's, just to get this music segment over, let's jump to Mercury Blues, the last song in our great show. It was released by David Lindley, a.k.a. De Paris La Tonk. <laughs> um, he is a rock country and world music artist, whatever the hell world music is. <laughs> um, <laughs> no one listens to it so, so we don't know <laughs> so here i'm just gonna do something fun he's a he's basically a guitarist a hired hand guitarist he toured with people he was he initially broke out in the 60s with a band called the kaleidoscope no one they put out four albums seems like they were like a big band type band and they tried to do psychedelic music and we're all totally hippie and but since kaleidoscope he pretty much he toured with Crosby, Stills, Stills, Nash, and Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor, you know, they all hang out. <laughs> um, so he was basically just a hired hand, you know, when they went on tour, he'd go play guitar in the background. But he also had his, his own band. In 1981, he formed his own band, El Rayo X, which they would perform from 81 to 89. And I'm just going to run through all of the different instruments that David Lindley knows how to play. <laughs> <laughs> He can play the guitar, the upright and electric bass, play the banjo, the mandolin, the sit turn, the Zowski, the bag llama, <laughs> the gumbus. You're just making the shit Tarongo. up. Now. Yeah, I know. This is made up. This isn't real. I, I'm not done yet. I'm not done. He can also play a kumbus, <laughs> a zither, a hardened filele. <laughs> Uh, and a fiddle. Well, the fiddle. The end. <laughs> one normal instrument and the rest are all made up. By the way, which one of those is your favorite? Um, <laughs> the kumbis. I, I like the charango, <laughs> but the kumbis is pretty good, too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dominic's oh. dying. He's dying. <laughs> Just to summarize, those are all like guitar type instruments, apparently. <laughs> apparently, I don't know. <laughs> I got tired of Googling. <laughs> Looking at pictures of them. All right, there so you have it. That is um that music segment took a turn. I learned that, that those were all real things. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, Phil Collins it makes another appearance in the music segment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go sum this episode up with our final thoughts. All right, Melissa. Let's- You knew it was coming eventually. (laughs) It was me, right? It's me. Oh, my God. What are your final thoughts on this episode? Um, That they didn't need to make it. (laughs) That they probably should have scrapped it like they did in season one and not gone back to it. (laughs) It was just one gigantic commercial for uh, indie racing. And Mm -hmm. I'm going to be honest. I don't care about indie racing. (laughs) And. Nobody like you could tell me you could put somebody who won the Indy 500 right now on on a TV show and I still wouldn't know who the hell he was. So <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a mistake banking on that people cared about Indy. That was the first problem. Um, but other than that, like it's 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 a bad episode. It's just all it's a fun episode because it's goofy, I guess. But it take it seems like it drags on like in the middle. Yeah. Because there's no real like story. And then all those things where you feel like you should be paying attention to it, like, oh, that burned car that he got in that box, they're going to come back to that. That's going to be important later on. But it was never important and never came back to it. (laughs) (laughs) These are like our most fun episodes, those ones that just make zero sense and kind of ramble on. Like It's it's like this script was like if you got two drunk writers together and someone wrote down their their rumblings right before they passed out at the bar. Because it's just, there's a bunch of stuff that didn't make any sense. They filled in the gaps. Yeah, still has a classic moment they, for me. They started off sober, and then they just as they got drunk, the episode got worse and worse and worse. Uh, I challenge that they were writers at all. I think they were just two drunks at a bar, and they were like, It'd "Be really cool, if Miami Vice did an episode about racing." Yeah, Crockett could race around Are you Miami. Questioning Wilton. <laughs> yes, I'm questioning Wilson right now. <laughs> That's what's so great about this is that they didn't even credit the real writer, so we could just rip on him nonstop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Dude, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm pretty sure like they were sitting in the it in the editing editing room watching this. Like, holy crap, this is terrible. I don't want my name on it. No, no, no I don't want my name on it. <laughs> Make up a name. I I feel like they got to the end of the season in recording. They're like shit, we're one episode short. Uh, do we have any B roll that we can put together into a standalone episode? Is there anything that we can make sense of some stuff we have laying around? But I will say, it has a classic moment for me that I'm going to go back to consistently. <laughs> is that that scene in the precinct between Danny and Frank? What is happening here? The How broken come they handshake. won't touch each other. How come? <laughs> what the hell is going on? I'm obsessed with that moment, and I will be going back to that again and again. John. What are your final thoughts on this episode? Well, like this episode, I'm just going <laughs> to... John, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> Figured, you know, if they didn't bother to come up with an ending, why should I come up with an ending? I don't... Why is it my job? Why am I going to have to put an end on this? <laughs> I gotta do everything Jove into for you. a wall. No one cares. No one cares. He <laughs> drove into a wall. What are we gonna do? Lowen Brow sucks. <laughs> um, That's gonna do it. I'm gonna go play. I, I, I'm gonna go play with my zither. <laughs> and your kumbis? <laughs> and my bag llama. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear your feedback. Are we off on this episode? Let us know. Email us goldtheheat at gmail.com. Or you can tweet at us. You can follow us on Facebook. There's numerous ways you can follow us. Go to the website goldtheheat.com. Click on About Us. You can find all the ways that you can find us. You know, you can find us on Stitcher, YouTube iTunes, I just submitted the podcast to TuneIn. Did you even know TuneIn had podcasts? I learned something this week that they did. So we'll be appearing on there soon, too. We would love to hear from you. Email the show. Like I said, go with the heat at gmail.com. And we'll see you all next time. Bye, bye.